Hello and welcome to another edition of Active Living. Today, we have an absolutely fantastic show planned for you today. We have Robert Sparks here. Robert is a retired Lieutenant Commander in the U.S. Army. And we have a show that is kind of centered around the service today. And we have a special guest all the way from Oregon that's going to be with us via, I won't say Skype, I'll say Zoom this time. So Robert, uh, why don't you introduce our guest? I sure will. First of all, you let your Navy uh, heritage come through. <laughs> I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the, oh, in the sorry Army. Oh, that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> well, we have a special guest today, as, as you pointed out, and I found Phil Fehrenbacher uh, approximately a year ago on Facebook, and I was amazed at the stories that he told about the Vietnam War. He'll be showing and discussing with us his artistry and storytelling abilities uh, in uh, his stories that are called In Country. And uh, they are found on Facebook. And he has on Facebook about 27,000 followers, which is wow. just very uh, amazing. Phil, welcome to our show. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, earlier, you shared with us how you began drawing cartoons at a very early age. Would you mind sharing with us um, and our viewers uh, when, when this all started and uh, your progression uh, in drawing uh, cartoons and finally coming around to things like your in-country stories? I'd be glad to. Um... Hello again, uh, George Robert. Um, I started off, well, being an only child, um, I grew up and um, had my best friends were my paper and pencil. And uh, ever since day one, I had been drawing, sketching. And my father at the time was working in an auto parts store and he had a lot of the coworkers, uh, he liked to poke fun at. And so I would draw a cartoon, they'd take them down and a big hit. So I, I kept it up and uh, all the way through grade school, I competed in various local contests, radio stations, Christmas cards, birthday cards, and won a few uh, free turkeys or <laughs> uh, whatever was uh, offered at the time. And, uh, and then I followed it up through high school, being on the art staff and, and uh, uh, special art and won a few uh, scholastic awards they had offered in the, uh, in the city at the time. So it's been a pretty constant uh, trend to draw. Did you have any formal training at all, at all, Phil, or did you just kind of take this up on your own? Well, mostly at the beginning it was on my own. Uh, however, uh, after I returned from the service, I took uh, an art school, a uh, three-year art program at night while my wife was <laughs> raising our three children uh, who were real <laughs> young at the time. So uh, I was working in Salem, commuting to Portland, back to Portland where we lived. And uh, uh, I would get off work, go right down to school at six o'clock and be there till nine and then come back. and. Uh, she usually had the kids to bed by then, and I didn't see much of them in those days. Uh, but no, most most of the training has been uh, my own. Well, we looked at uh, the quality of your work is absolutely fantastic. When we see, uh, we've got some in our background here, as you can see, and we'll get into a lot more as, as we get into uh, some of the actual cartoons that you've done. Yeah, one of the things that... Uh, my, one of my sons told me is how modern these drawings look. They, they don't look like something that, that was uh, from the Vietnam War. They have a modern twist to them. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully our viewers will agree right. with, with that once they start to see uh, the in-country stories that we're going to show them today. Um, we have a variety of Phil's stories that we're going to share with our viewers. And regardless of your branch of service, we think these stories ring true with all veterans. And even if you're not a veteran, uh, the stories will provide a humorous look 
at uh, typical military situations, which all our viewers should enjoy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what point did you uh, enter the service, uh, Phil? Um, entered February 1966, and uh, back in those days, Fort Lewis wasn't uh, training, basic training. Uh, so you either went to Fort Ord or to Fort Polk, and luckily I got Fort Ord. Were you uh, married uh, at the time? No, I wasn't. Oh, okay. Uh, this is prior to being being married and having the three kids. Oh, no. <laughs> that came. So, so were, were, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I enlisted for four years uh, with uh, three of my high school friends under the buddy system. Okay. And, uh, so we all signed up for armored and at some point in Germany. Uh, at some point, the uh, I had some kind of a profile with my glasses, and I couldn't uh, I couldn't ask for armored at that point. I don't remember why exactly. Uh, so anyway, uh, they after basic all stayed together, went through armored, and then went to Germany. I uh, I had a story about how I became a illustrator. Um, I was in basic drawing the cartoons of the company commander and executive officer um, poking fun at them and one day I was told to report to the orderly room. I reported, saluted, looked down and saw my drawings on top of the uh, commanders or the company commander's desk and I thought oh man I'm toast. <laughs> um, so they locked my heels and walked around yelling at me for about five minutes or so and then they just started laughing and couldn't help it and said, you know, these are great, you know, how would you like to do this in the military? And I said, well, yeah, I'd love to. And uh, it, being it was early in the training, uh, they never mentioned it again. I never, it was never brought up. And so at the end of basic, I was assigned to Fort Rucker helicopter maintenance school. And I uh, reported there and I was really worried because all these people were so mechanical and I'm I'm legendary for lack of. Uh, <laughs> right. They had rumors about, you know, if you bolo from there, you're going to Mortarman School or something. <laughs> so anyway, I'd been there for about three or four days waiting for a class to form and was called to the orderly room again and told that I'd been made permanent party as an illustrator. They Whoa. had to look it up. They didn't know what the MOS was. That's fantastic. <laughs> so they you actually know, have an MOS in the service for an illustrator. 81E20 at the time. Wow. <laughs> I did not know that. Being an ex-Navy uh, guy, I did not know that we had uh, illustrator MOSs. <laughs> yeah, that's so they made me training aides and uh, with about six or eight other civilian and military uh, artists. That's fantastic. And I had signed up for Europe, so I had told them that I really wanted to go to Europe. And uh, the... Uh, uh, captain in charge of our group wanted me to stay there and he says you know if you go to Germany you're probably going to be out in the cold and uh, uncomfortable and and he says I can guarantee if you stay here you won't go to Vietnam uh, but I wanted to go to Germany so I pressed it and, and got sent over to uh, over Amergau Germany for uh, 15 months I believe and that's where I got my orders for Vietnam. Oh, wow. and uh, you weren't cold in Vietnam, I'm sure. Uh, no, <laughs> we, went, <laughs> we went from about uh, I don't know, a foot and a half of snow in Oberammergau to I don't know what it was when they opened the door of that plane and basically sucked the air out of the, <laughs> the whole uh, jet. Yeah, I believe it. So Phil, what kind of units were you assigned to in Vietnam? Um, I was supposed to go to the 6th PSYOPs Battalion in Benoit and doing uh, what I assumed would be, you know, dropping leaflets out of helicopters and, and that's where some of the cartoons came from too. Um, but I landed right during Tet of 68 and they trashed my orders and uh, I ended up uh, after two or three days uh, finding out that I was assigned to the 519th MI Battalion. And um, 
it was a short ways away. We were on a little small compound with 200 men at the edge of the jungle at the end of a dirt road. And uh, uh, after that, I was there for 14 months. Then I transferred over to an intelligence center for combined documents exploitation. And all captured documents were sent there where they were uh, evaluated and translated and uh, then distributed them to whoever needed to know the information, minefields, plans of attack or whatever. And that at that point you were doing you were doing drawings all along or were you, oh, no. Were you... no, I hadn't done drawings at all. Uh, oh, really? No, I was a, I ended up being an intelligence. I worked uh, was promoted into intelligence um, analyst ninety six B and uh, promoted to a staff sergeant. So you really didn't start doing these uh, military cartoons until after you got out of the service, is that correct? Well, it was way after I got out of the service. Okay. Uh, actually, I would, <clears throat> excuse me, um, at the time, like I said, we had uh, three children and a lot of bills, and so I was doing freelance every night while I was being a, a designer for the state of Oregon during the day. So I was busy pretty much all the time and didn't have time for doing this kind of a project. Right. So I had to wait until after I retired. I didn't start it till after I retired. Actually, it's been, it'll be 10 years next uh, year. Wow. For doing the in-country. So how many in-country uh, drawings have you done this far? Uh, I'm thinking somewhere around 450, maybe. Wow. Three books and a fourth one, maybe. Oh, that's a, that's amazing, and we're all, we're only going to talk about 35 of those, so we're <laughs> we're talking less than 10 percent. Right, right. So are, so are, are we ready to? Why don't we get into it? Dive into. Why don't we take a look at some of these cartoons and see what uh, see we see what you've been doing, Phil? All right. The first one we got here is Welcome to the Army. Okay. Uh, this actually happened to me. Um, I went down and <laughs> reported to the uh, Portland uh, Induction Center. And like I said, I was lucky because I had enlisted, but a lot of the guys were drafted. And so they had everybody down in their skivvies and just completed their physical and um, the sergeant came in and put his arm down between two guys and he said from here on down you're in the marines and <laughs> there was some real unhappy people uh, marines are great if you want to be a marine and enlist but when you think it couldn't get any worse when you got drafted into the army uh it was it was another level disappointment i think there was there's probably some real tears uh, coming out of those people. Yes, there were. So hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Uh, how did how did you get the inspiration for this? Because I don't think uh, you you ended up at uh, Fort Polk, did you? I did not. Okay. Yeah. So, so how did the how, how did you come up on this one in terms of inspired to do it? <laughs> Well, it, it, like I said, it's because I was doing it after the fact, oh, I okay. guess. I had heard from others going through. And I also remember seeing the movie uh, Tigerland, uh, Colin Farrell. And uh, uh, so I had talked to some of my friends and, and they had gone through there uh, before, as a, like a preparation before going over to Vietnam. And that's from what I've heard, it's pretty close. I mean, they've got the villages, the humidity and the temperature and everything is pretty close. So I just thought it would be kind of humorous to have one of the guys thinking, oh boy, here's, you know, this is Disney World. We're going to a theme park. And uh, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm mean, yeah, right. happy on the other end. A theme park, all right. <laughs> uh, the next one we're looking at is same, same, coming or going. Can you talk about that one a little bit? Sure. Uh, 
as I said, I landed at the beginning of Tet of 68 and things were very tense. They told us to be ready to jump up and hit the wall if we had to. So the new guys, most of us slept with our clothes on, boots on, everything <laughs> right, you know, ready to go. Rifle uh, in hand and ready to shoot, right? Right, right. And uh, the old guys that had been there for a while, and yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, they had heard this a lot. So they would go ahead and go about their business and go to bed like they usually did. And um, this lasted for about a month or so that you're pretty cautious. And then you kind of get into a routine where you're not as worried and you get used to it. And then you get close to the end of your tour and all of a sudden you're getting kind of nervous about uh, having something happen when you're just about ready to go home. Yeah. And so you start getting into that same uh, protective, worried um, posture, you know, and start dressing with your clothes again because you don't want <laughs> anything to happen on the way out. Right, right. So the first leech inspection, did you ever get into leeches while you were in Vietnam? I didn't have any on me, uh, not where we were. I wasn't that often that we went out. Uh, like I said, most of the time it was like in a boat or uh, um, in a Jeep. So no, but I'd seen the leeches and, and the guys, you, you can't get what you can't see. and there wasn't a whole lot of pain involved with them, you know, and you find out who your friends are real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I can, I can believe that. <laughs> the next one we want to look at is invasion of the uh, body snatchers. The, uh, the term kind of hit me after I did the, the drawing, but I wanted to show some of the special ops and some of the, uh, you know, the LERPs, the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. Uh, some of them were either ambush or you know, snatching people or the Phoenix program, uh, another one that uh, was pretty active at the time. And I thought it'd be pretty humorous to show some really good operatives that are snatching Ho Chi Minh and taking them back down across the DMZ. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> that's who I thought that was. I was going to ask you that question. Was that was that Ho Chi Minh? <laughs> yep. That was uh, that was a very dangerous mission, uh, as uh, we both know, or we all know. Um, next, we have winning the hearts and minds with MedCap. Did uh, did you have a MedCap uh, activity uh, near you uh, when you we were in did. Vietnam? We did, yeah, and they would go out, and uh, uh, it took a while for them to get people that would come forward. Uh, a lot were really intimidated by the VC, and uh, uh, but they they were very popular and and offered free medical uh, kids, why uh, mothers. Uh, the thing I was trying to show in that was it seemed like the Vietnamese kids, even though they were cute and young and everything, they were always a little bit uh, mature, more mature than our kids. You know, I mean, he's doing a little nursery rhyme and the kid's asking for a free cigarette. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and, and when you would watch these little kids, they'd be playing marbles. And if they got into a scrap, I mean, it was not or patter it looked like an episode of kung fu i mean it was they were really uh protective about their own stuff really hmm. yeah now when you uh one of the ones i really liked is the tunnel rat uh the tunnel rat one and this is the one that would scare the hell out of me if i was a tunnel rat well, I was never so happy to be over six feet and 200 pounds in my life because <laughs> he asked me to go anywhere. Um, it was scary. And uh, the way they booby trapped them or, or 
had snakes or whatever. They had little snake pits, uh, the punji snakes, uh, you know, the little things that you could trip. And uh, a friend of mine I worked with in Portland uh, when I got out of the service had been a marine tunnel rat. And he normally, he said he would go in head first, but he had this one tunnel. He decided, well, I, I think I'm gonna go in feet first. And as he started to go in, the tunnel collapsed on his leg. Wow. So when they finally got the, the, the dirt lifted up and, and it had the couple beams that had been across the hole, uh, when they lifted a beam, his foot went with it. And he oh. had a punji stake right through the, right through his foot. Wow. So, you know, that's, he was so lucky he didn't go head first that time. That's got to be one of the most dangerous jobs in the, in the service. There was a couple of them, and that was probably the worst. I, I can imagine uh, being slightly claustrophobic wasn't for me. Okay, next we have the Master Recyclers. And this one <laughs> really uh, struck home with me because uh, where I was, this actually occurred. But uh, why don't you tell us uh, how it was where you were in Vietnam? It happened just that way. Uh, they actually did have a shotgun uh, packing rider in the garbage truck to keep the, the Vietnamese would jump up on the back and throw stuff off the road while it was moving. And uh, they, they would, somebody on the sides would be taking it, packing it off someplace. And uh, uh, I thought it was kind of funny that this is stuff we're throwing away, but you don't want the Vietnamese to get it. Um, I know they, you know, they were so uh, clever with it. When they, when they threw something away, there was no possible use for it. Yeah, uh, yeah. they're the masters, tires. like you say, they're masters at recycling. Yeah, they would take the tires and make sandals from them. You know, they would take, they made some beautiful little foot lockers and they were kind of copper colored or brass colored and with these little accent strips of wood and you open them up and you'd see hundreds of beer cans they had flattened out and put the shiny side out really gorgeous yeah huh. so the next one is uh, your first guard duty and this has got to be interesting because you're out there by yourself right yeah well sometimes uh the first time i was and uh uh, scared the daylights out of me because I have kind of an imagination and every bush was moving. Uh, you've got flares going off around you. Uh, you'll see tracers going off in the distance and booms everywhere. And uh, of course you have the animal life, the rats and everything else that are scurrying around. And uh, it was, yeah, it was pretty tense. Uh, I had one time where I had a starlight scope and I was looking out and everything was kind of greenish. And uh, uh, I had a bat fly right in front of me and there was this big flash of green and I just about <laughs> had a heart attack. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> so so our next uh, drawing is is the scrounger. And all units had a scrounger. Phil, who, who was the scrounger in your unit? Do you rem remember? I do. <laughs> His name was Benny Burns. He was a uh, um, former naval uh, enlisted, and he was a lieutenant in the army now. And he could get anything anywhere. Uh, <laughs> the guy was amazing. And we always ended up, we had been cut off uh, for a few weeks without a, a lot of supplies. And uh, when they finally broke through and relieved us, he got a big trailer full of ice beer and uh, steaks Whoa. By the, they call them steaks but they were you know a little more water buffalo -y, i think but it was good at the time yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know one of the things we didn't do when we were talking about the tunnel rat is you have a, a video that you put together uh regarding how you created that uh, can we can we run that and you can maybe talk to us a little bit about how you create one of these cartoons? Okay. Is it going? Yes. 
okay. Um, what I do is I do a rough sketch and then I take a picture of it. I bring it into my full create program on my iPad and then I clean it up a little bit. And then this is all done in layers, each layer getting progressively better quality until I do the inking stage. And then after the inking stage, then I do another layer with color. Wow. So you don't, you can't mess things up too badly. You just it, better than the old good old days. I'll tell you. Uh, the only bad thing is that you don't end up with an original drawing anymore. They're all electric you know, or digital, and uh, I really like having original drawings. But uh, but this is anyway, all done on an iPad. Yes, oh, uh, that's... And the iPad actually made that recording you're looking at. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, and you'll notice that some things change during the creation. I changed my mind about maybe a couple of the items in the drawing or how I was going to do it. Uh, it's kind of a process that changes when you get uh, the chance to improve along the way. A lot of times I change the verbiage too. Sure. Think it's something better. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So why don't we go on to the next uh, next one? Where are we at now? The scrum, we did the scrum. Tet, yeah, we're Tet. Tet 1968. <laughs> yeah, uh, another experience that <laughs> was pretty sobering. Uh, we were with a bunch of clerks and supply people and uh, uh, not infantry. Uh, we had some people that had been uh, trained uh, AIT infantry in that, but then they went on and had other MOSs. Uh, so anyway, uh, everybody became an infantryman during Tet of 68. Uh, we were under attack for days and uh, it, like I say, clerk typists and uh, intel analysts and cooks and supply people, we all were on the wall. So. Uh, ended up one time on the working end of an M60 uh, that I had never fired before. And the guy asked me if I knew how to do it, and I said no, and he was gone, of course, by then. Uh, but luckily, that time, nothing happened. Uh, this was just somebody that was supposed to be coming down the road towards our compound. So I well, got off there pretty easy. <laughs> sounds like a scary time, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a little tense. That was, uh, uh, like I say, Tet and the May Offensive of 68. Uh, some people called it a little Tet, but it happened shortly uh, May in May. That kind of leads us right into the next slide, which is about the morale officer. <laughs> yeah, the... Uh, uh, the, the animal life the mosquitoes, the snakes, um, rats, rats everywhere, and uh, uh, centipedes. You know, they have a foot long, 12, 18 inch long centipedes. Really? And spiders. Wow. <laughs> we had a guy that had his hand, dropped his hand uh, one night outside of the, uh, off the edge of his cot and got bit by a spider and they had to evacuate him. Uh, swelled up so bad. Wow. But um, um, lost my place there. Well, we're talking about the uh, the officers trying to make these uh, unfortunate <laughs> soldiers happy. Yeah, which is yeah. a gigantic job. <laughs> well, you know, I loved having the two mosquitoes dragging the guy off. Yeah, and, I love uh, that. Yeah, you know, the, the senior officers just kind of bring it off to somebody else. It's your responsibility to make them happy. Right. <laughs> That's Mission a great impossible. one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, never work in your MOS. Um, why don't you tell us yeah. about that one? Were you, were you able to work in your MOS at all? Well, not really. Not after that. Uh, <laughs> but I had the friends who had uh, uh, gone through the training. Uh, I'm thinking of our mailman we had. He was a counterintelligence trained. And, uh, you know, he went through, uh, what is it, Baltimore, Fort Holabird, Maryland, the Intel Center, 
spies would go after each other with trench coats, army haircuts, and low quarters, trying to follow each other through the streets, you know, and get all the experience. And then when they hit Vietnam, they ended up wherever they needed them. And uh, some guys, uh, like he, was made into a mailman. So he would be packing his mail around everywhere, whistling secret agent man. Right. Uh, his trademark. <laughs> Felt just, sorry for him. Just remember, folks, the needs of the Army come first. There it is. <laughs> they, had a, they had a joke about You've that. You've never heard that one before, have you, Phil? <laughs> no. <laughs> Another thing they would say was join the NVA, work in your MOS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, never work in your MOS, right? Right. So advice from a guy who really knows his, uh, knows his. That's another one that we've got coming up here. Yeah, that uh, I have a couple on that subject. It was really not a good job. And, and. I was very fortunate, like I said, to come in the country as an E5. Uh, so they put me in charge of it, but I didn't have to do it. And uh, it is a real not good job. And everybody, uh, it's it's right up there among the worst, but it's just not as dangerous as a tunnel rat. It's just a bad job. And it takes forever. They had to stir it until it turned to ash. That takes a while. It's only 105 out there anyway, you know, before you light the fire. Right. <laughs> so for our viewers, I, I'm going to make a comment here, Phil. This is a human waste disposal. Uh, this is how we disposed of it in <laughs> Vietnam. And uh, uh, as you pointed out, uh, this is not the job you wanted at any time. <laughs> uh, our next one is... Um, uh, pucker factor, um, and uh, did you have helicopter units uh, near you? Um, not really, um, but since I've uh, been doing the in-country, I've been uh, working with a lot of uh, Vietnam reenactment uh, people. Uh, one of the one of the biggest ones is the. Uh, Rolling Thunder, uh, the Vietnam experience in the UK. And they had a project to restore a Marine uh, helicopter, Huey. And I think they titled it VMO6 was the official title. And they would, they were wondering if I would portray this because it was very common among the helicopter pilots that the worse the job, the worse the detail, the more you sucked up the seat of the helicopter, uh, the pucker factor. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's those, those two pilots. So yeah, that's really good. Great, I like that. Great, uh, <laughs> so they, they uh, enjoyed that quite a bit. These, these guys were really, uh, we've got another one coming up here, trolling for Charlie, but I'm just gonna make the comment, they were really fearless. I know. Uh, I had two of the, two helicopter pilots that worked for me after Vietnam, and both of them had actually been shot down mm -hmm. and rescued. So yeah, those guys had. Uh, there I, was. Uh, I can't say what I really want to say, want yeah. to say but anyway, they're 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 very yeah. brave people. Right, and about ten percent of the Medal of Honors that were awarded in Vietnam went to the heli helicopter pilots, the crews or those associated with helicopter units. So, yeah. so that's that's how fearless those people were. Yeah. Trolling would, for Charlie. Yeah, you wouldn't think a lot of those would even uh, fly after with all, you see all the bullet hole and damage they took. That's correct. But what we have here is a hunter, hunter killer team. Have you seen yeah. one of those? I, I, w I had not really witnessed that. Uh, this is, again, somebody else had mentioned to me and thought it would be a good, since you say, you know, dangerous job, somebody that's in the small helicopter, all they had was either individual rifle or maybe an M60 if they're lucky and to protect themselves. And they're just trying to draw fire from the ground and up high and behind them, you'd have a Cobra or another gunship that would uh, come in and, and uh, after they drop smoke, 
give them an idea of where they are, then they would peel off and and clean up. But a great job that would be, huh? Yeah. I had a, a cousin who was uh, flying a, a small single engine aircraft trying to identify targets in Vietnam as well. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. So that would be a, a tough one as well. Like a bird dog or something. Yep. R-H-I-P. Yes, sometimes. Yeah, this, <laughs> this uh, actually, I saw this witness kind of thing too because uh, they didn't want to ruin the reputation of some of the upcoming officers, you know. So <laughs> the officer got off with the uh, uh, urinary tract infection, you know, <laughs> for, the, <laughs> for the poor enlisted guy. I mean, you, you've got venereal disease. Yeah, know? right. <laughs> right. And, and you were assigned in Saigon, I understand, for a while. Yes, I I'm was. Sure, I'm sure there was a lot of that going on there. It, well, Yes. <laughs> we were surrounded by bars and houses of ill repute, I view. Well, a lot right. of busy M, uh, MP action in those areas. Oh, there's no I in team. Guess who did what? Yes, this did happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it yeah. happened. It happened to me <laughs> on, did se it? <laughs> on several occasions. Yeah, they. Uh, Commanders would come out, make a brief appearance, you know, and help talk, and we're in this together. But for a however long they were together, <laughs> right? Not that long in most cases. Two and, minutes uh, and he's gone. Got yep. the umbrella out, and you know, looking looking pretty good in his starch fatigues. So the next one is learning inter-service cooperation, and. Uh, did, did you happen to see any of, uh, of this and uh, you know I did in your time uh, there it wasn't um, look quite like this but it was obviously had made a mistake assumed that they were Army or Air Force or something and uh, uh, once it dawned on them they were doing a lot of apologies and but I thought it'd be really great to have somebody uh, think that they were higher ranked and could get away with talking back to them. So uh, that's been, that was a pretty popular cartoon. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'll and, bet. And for our viewers, uh, uh, a captain in the Army is a junior, not junior, junior officer, but he's, he's a junior grade officer. A captain in the Navy is a senior officer. Absolutely. So uh, it uh, if, if you don't have the branch of service associated with where that captain is coming from, you can you can get yourself into some deep trouble. Big there. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Showing the new boss around, that, that would be interesting. Yeah, that's... Uh, oh, this is, uh, this is perfect. <laughs> you got a crusty old sergeant showing the brand new... <laughs> Butter bar. E, uh, E1, where to go, right? Right, I, I, I tried or to... I should say, O1. O1, yes. <laughs> Butter yeah, bar. The bar. <laughs> right. Um, I tried to make him look like a little kid, you know, holding his dad's hand. Uh, That's perfect. I'm still in charge. Oh, yeah, but don't touch anything and try to keep up, you know. <laughs> this is great. I love that one. <laughs> yeah. And, and we had a saying in, in the unit that I was in, you know, what was the difference between the U.S. Army and the Boy Scouts? And the answer is the Boy Scouts have adult leadership, and this this cart <laughs> cartoon right here points that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'd like yeah. to hear more about the monsoon washing machine. That uh, <laughs> we we had it. I was down, like I said, outside of Saigon a little ways, and uh, ours came in. It seemed like every day, and it lasted for several hours and the river would flood, it would flood our compound. And uh, then when it quit, then it would start slowly receding. The sun would come out and you'd just see nothing but steam rising. And it was just unbelievable um, how muggy and, and, and hot it got. Um, some of the people I talked to that were further north uh, said that they experienced it nonstop. It didn't stop like, you know, after a couple hours each day. 
but ours would roll in every day about the same time, last for a couple hours, and then gone. Wow. And like you say, the humidity must have been hum humongous after a, a rain and a heat like that. Terrible, yeah. So next is your helmet. Did the, did the guys in your unit uh, decorate their helmets like this, or was this somebody's uh, Somewhat. Memory? Yeah, somewhat, uh, as long as it wasn't too off-colored or controversial or something that's going to make senior officers unhappy uh, uh, about their political stances or, you know, anti-war, whatever, but most got away with it, but I read a, a lot of the responses from the readers and they said they weren't able to do that kind of thing. Some were, guys in the field mostly had no problem, but uh, in some of the other support units, they seemed to frown on uh, right. custom, custom head, headliners. Uh, every day was Easter is, a, is an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I tried to make that kind of light. I mean, it wasn't a funny subject, but uh, it was around Easter that I did this. And I thought, well, it'd be kind of fun to have him singing, hopping down the bunny trail, you know, while he's uh, <laughs> everything else in the background is not a, exactly finding Easter eggs, but, uh, you know, uh, weapons caches, booby traps, uh, yeah. tunnel, and... Uh, I tried to make things light. I mean, it was a, really a terrible war, but at the same time, there were some things you could laugh at, and that's what I've tried to do with these comics. Yeah. Charlie gets into motivational speaking. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you have any Korean units near you? Yes, we did. And uh, uh, down the road a ways, they had, uh, I think it was a white horse, and uh, uh, what was the other one? can't remember tiger maybe uh we had a karate uh instructors that would come a couple of days a week and uh vietnamese and the charlie hated they were word scared to death of the rocks uh because they were very very brutal in their questioning and everything else and i don't think a lot of the rocks much cared for the vietnamese civilians either because they all seemed to be kind of stay away from them. Um, but uh, they were very, very good soldiers. Um, and uh, I tried to make it obvious that this guy sees the light and is is spilling his guts <laughs> to go with the Americans, you know. Uh, right. Because he knows what's in store for him there. Interesting. PsyOps plays the Jody card. Yeah, that was just a little, we always heard about Jody when we were in basic and everything else, you know, and I thought, well, this, and since these people are so far away from home, uh, I thought it'd be pretty cute to have PSYOPs dropping leaflets about Jody and they know, <laughs> your, I'll, we bet your neighbor, Wen knows, you know, so uh, little play on, play so, on the thing. So Phil, could you, uh, for our viewers, tell them who Jody is? Well, Jody was always the guy that had your girl or got your girl after you left and, and dated and, and uh, had the car and didn't go in the military and uh, probably got the good jobs and everything else, you know. It was just, yeah. He was, he was the man. <laughs> Did you guys get any um, radio, um, you know, transmissions from North, North Korea or North, uh, North Vietnam? like the old days in World War II where you had these ladies who were playing American music and trying to convert people to their side. Did you have any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was her name? Uh, Hanoi Hannah was Rose. one of them, wasn't it? What was that? Hanoi Hannah. That's it, Hanoi Hannah, yeah. And she was... She was, I did a cartoon about that because she had all the latest information. She knew where the people were. And she, you know, kind of broadcast that your unit, uh, we know where you are. You don't want to go here because we're ready for you. And uh, she was very up to date on every, I did a cartoon about that 
two guys playing chess and she's on the radio and she's telling their unit not to do what they're thinking of doing and then she tells the one guy not wise to trade queens like she sees is, that too is that so, right you know oh so you have a series uh, within in country having to do with vietnam veterans and this is the uh, one here having to do with post-traumatic stress di disorder. And yes. what, what was the inspiration for this one? Well, um, for one thing, I wanted to be able to show the difference between being there and then afterwards dealing with everything that's happened. Yep, the, the uh, still check the perimeter at night? Yeah, uh, again, a lot of the people that I correspond with and respond to me uh, still have hypervigilance and you're always you go into a restaurant you want to be facing the entrance you don't want to have your back to the entrance all the vets do the same thing and uh, same thing with the house securing the house here this guy goes around and checks everything and then the wife is it okay yeah I better check again you know because it's, I do the same thing here, walk around the house, check the locks a couple times. Really? It wasn't bad when I had a big dog, but I don't have a big dog anymore. <laughs> wow. Okay, Sis Siskel and Ebert. Uh, <laughs> we have a, looks like a Vietnam vet watching a, a uh, Rambo movie here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're pretty hard on uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, the military, ex-military, have a hard time with guns that shoot 300 shots, you know, and, and uh, stand up there in front of 20 guys and never get wounded or nicked or anything. And uh, they're very critical, uh, a lot of them, you know, like uh, Apocalypse Now and some of the other Rambo movies. Uh, they're pretty vocal about it, so I thought it'd be kind of funny if he... That's, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting observation. How about a DD-214 and an 11B MOS? Yeah, um, the, um, a lot of the guys experiencing problems now are required to try to find supporting medical records to document uh, why they might be having problems with their back or their knees or whatever now. Right. And it just doesn't, for the most part, exist. But 11B is infantryman and uh, jumping out of a helicopter or uh, with a big pack on your back that may be eight, 10 feet off the ground, uh, it took a toll. And they should, just the comment was basically that they should take that into account and not even argue about it. but. Some of the vet, uh, when they appraise the the people, uh, won't they? They make it very difficult. Yeah, are they are they still experiencing a lot of problems with the VA, or is the VA pretty uh, uh, easy to deal with? Uh, the medical part, I have had no problem where I live. I've I've heard of other problems, but uh, uh, the medical and the pharmacy, I. I get along great uh, when they do the comp on the disabilities there's been a lot of uh, difference of opinion there on what, whether it's uh, service related or not and, yeah. and you'll see that all over the country kind of handled differently yeah I've got some friends who have tried to go through that with uh, Agent Orange um, yeah. and uh, so that's you know, he, he was turned down two or three times, but I think he finally got accepted. Oh, that's good. Okay, next is the flashback time machine and what uh, the sounds of a Huey helicopter does to us. Yeah, you... it's... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, do, do, does the sound affect you the way it does me? It does, yeah. You're a helicopter. Uh, sometimes it's music. Uh, sometimes it's a certain smell or but the helicopter automatically just throws you right back and uh, um, 
uh, funny thing was I, I got the idea in the middle of the night for that cartoon. And I knew if I didn't write it down, I'd lose it. So I got up, it was probably about 2, 2.30, and, and uh, grabbed a piece of paper and scribbled down a quick little idea. And Because I've for, I'd forgotten them before, so I knew I had to do that. Yeah. And I, it was a good idea. So it's a I'm great idea. Uh, uh, anyway, that's how that one came to be about. Family reunions, that's another interesting one, I would think. <laughs> yeah, that was more of a sight gag. I, I, you know, there had been quite a few of the uh, hammer Asians, I think they called them, and they had the oh, the baby lift program uh, right after the end of the war where they tried to get a lot of the babies out of Vietnam because I think they had a pretty tough life uh, being American and Vietnamese. Oh, yeah. Um, growing up in that. And that. Uh, I just thought it would be kind of funny to have the woman thinking that maybe this is somebody that he served with over there and and just having him be kind of an exact duplicate other than Asian features, you know? <laughs> yeah. Big yeah. ears. <laughs> yeah. It's perfect. So happy Veterans Day. What are you what are you trying to tell us here? Um well That's the one where um, you have most of the Vietnam vets have adjusted pretty well. And by now, people have gotten over the attitude they had when they first come home and they thank you for your service and, and all the niceties and everything. But there's people that have slipped through the cracks that haven't uh, adapted well and are still, and even younger vets uh, uh, that you know, like she's thanking the guy who's productive and uh, served his time. Uh, but here's a guy who's obviously having trouble in the alley that. Uh, uh, yeah, and that's know. very appropriate today with, uh, you know, Afghanistan and a yes. lot of those veterans. This is one of the cartoons that I think got over 200,000 likes. Uh, I, I can believe it. Yeah. Well. Wow. How about the reunion? Oh, here we go. <laughs> that was kind of basically in my mind because I have not been to a reunion, but I've seen some pictures and I thought, you know, people obviously don't look the same. And, uh, you know, somebody making a slide about one of the women he used to date or something. Oh, you mean my wife, you know? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kind of setting them up for. <laughs> I like the but, one, I like the one where he can't get into his uniform. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's kind of grim. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Phil, I have been to some reunions, and it seems like that the bad times weren't really as bad as we thought they were fifty years ago. Uh, where I, how many did you have? Or were they good attendance? Uh, yes, we, we, we did have good attendance. Um, Merry Let's move on to Merry Christmas to my in-country friends. Yeah, that was a kind of a graphic that hit me, trying to get the Christmas spirit uh, and having Santa reflected in the water uh, along with the star instead of a flare. Um, I thought would be kind of a nice way. I mean, people tried to do the best they could. They some actually had um, little trees shipped to them, uh, parents, and they would decorate them. Or some guys just had strings of light they would just put around a bush or something where they could. Uh, but somehow they tried to celebrate Christmas. Yeah, it's great. We got uh, one more slide that we want to take a look at, and that's the Vietnam uh, Veterans Day. Yeah, that's uh, some of the... Uh, vet, uh, volunteered and uh, enlisted in, in, in the Vietnam War and some of them were jerked right out of college and uh, or off the street and and uh, drafted and but however they got there they were veterans they were Vietnam veterans they'd been there uh, the one thing I was really surprised in seeing um, responses from all the readers was how many that were drafted uh, decided to make it a career. 
it's a real high, hot, lot higher percentage than I would have thought. Really? I was not aware yeah. of that. Yeah. Interesting. Well, this has been fantastic, Phil. Uh, do you have um, a website or something that our watchers could uh, go to and learn more about you and your, your work? Um, I have a couple of pages on Facebook. Great. One is in country, in hyphen country. And uh, then I have another book that I did about senior citizens called Gray Area. Oh, that would be interesting. <laughs> I can relate to that. Well, actually, not too much gray left. There's not too much hair left. <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, if you if you can find the name, uh, I have them all listed on my personal Phil Fernbacher Facebook page too. Phil, I'm I'm pleased that I discovered your in-country uh, stories on Facebook. Got to meet you and finally collaborate with you, George and Ian, on the production of today's show. You are a true gift in telling Vietnam War stories, using your skills and artistry and humor. Your stories ring true for all veterans of all services of all eras. And for viewers who are not veterans, your stories provide a humorous look at many typical military situations that we've reviewed today. It's been a privilege meeting and working with you on this project. We wish you continued success in telling more in-country stories for us to talk about in the future. Thanks again for joining us, Phil. It's been great, and I love all of these uh, these characters that characters that you've uh, created. So thank well, you very much, and uh, thank everyone for watching. This is uh, George Sinnott, and uh, we'll be back again with another show at a later date. So talk to you later. Bye thank now. you very much for the opportunity, George and, and Robert. And You're very welcome. <laughs>